In this video, we will introduce the autoencoder and its various uses for unsupervised representation learning. The models that we have discussed so far use training pairs of the form xy in which the feature variables correspond to x and the target variable corresponds to y. So in this case, you have a clear separation between the feature variables and the target variable. So the target variable essentially provides supervision for the learning process. So a natural question arises as to what happens when we do not have a target variable. So imagine a situation we want, where we want to capture a model of the distribution of the training data without the guidance of the target. This problem is essentially an unsupervised learning problem. To provide an understanding of unsupervised learning, let me provide an example. So consider the case where you have a two-dimensional data set in which all points are distributed on the circumference of an origin-centered circle. And also imagine that all points in the first and the third quadrant belong to the class plus one and the remaining points are minus one. So in this case, the class variable provides focus to the learning process of the supervised model. And irrespective of the distribution of the feature variables, most learning models should be able to learn how the feature variables are related to the class variable. On the other hand, when you have an unsupervised model, it somehow needs to recognize the circular manifold without being told upfront. Of course, once the model recognizes that the data is distributed on the circumference of a circle, it can represent the data in only one dimension using the angular position of that point because the radius can be a global parameter for this model. In general, of course, for unsupervised learning, the best way of modeling is dataset dependent. You could have datasets with different types of distributions, such as you might have clusters, you might have nonlinear manifolds. And in these cases, the lack of supervision often causes problems in unsupervised learning. That is one of the reasons why unsupervised learning is considered more difficult than supervised learning. You're trying to learn the relationships among many feature variables rather than being focused on a single uh, feature of the data which you need to learn. Now, you might have noticed in the previous slide that uh, when we gave the example of the circular distribution, once you learn the unsupervised model, you can represent it in only one dimension corresponding to the angular placement of the point. So essentially, you are able to compress the representation of each data point. This is generally true where unsupervised models are closely related to compression because the compression uses a model of regularities in the data. That is what unsupervised learning is all about. So just to provide some specific examples, in generative models, you represent the data in terms of a compressed parameter set. In clustering models, you represent the data in terms of cluster statistics. Matrix factorization represents the data in terms of low rank approximations, which are essentially compressed matrices. As we will see, Autoencoders are an excellent way to perform matrix factorizations of various types. So the autoencoder also provides a compressed representation of the data. So what is the best way to learn the regularities in your underlying data distribution? So all neural networks work with input-output pairs. So in the, in the supervised problem, your output is the class label. And the weights are learned in such a way so as to optimize the prediction of the class label. However, in a neural network, you're trying to learn how the feature variables are related to one another. So in this case, the output is exactly the same as the input. So what you're trying to do is that given uh, a, a D-dimensional data point, you're trying to replicate it using the neural network. So you can see I have shown a figure of an autoencoder here, which has three hidden layers. It has an input layer and an output layer with exactly the same number of dimensions. 
so uh, so the outputs need to be exactly the same as the inputs so typically you will penalize each training instance depending on how far it is from the input so here the x1 prime needs to be the same as x1 so you uh, so the loss function a squared loss function will typically take the difference of the two square them and then add it up over all the outputs so uh, it might seem that uh, reconstructing the data uh, uh, from the input to the output it might seem like a trivial matter so one question that one might ask is that hey i can just copy the data forward from one layer to another and that's how i can replicate the input to the output however uh, as you might have noticed in the previous slide the hidden layers contain fewer units than the input layer or the output layer so for example here the input layer has five units the next layer has three and the innermost unit has uh, the, the innermost layer has only two units this is in general true where uh, the number of units in the middle are constricted so the portion before the constriction is referred to as as an encoder which learns the reduced code which correspond to the activations of the innermost layer and the portion after the constriction is referred to as a decoder which reconstructs these uh, uh, reduced representation of the points into the data set into the or original representation so uh, so as you can see the uh, this particular architecture provides you a reduced representation of the data set this is very similar to what we do in dimensional reduction techniques like singular value decomposition and principal component analysis in fact as we will see in a later lecture singular value decomposition is a special case of autoencoders so the basic structure of an auto so let's look at the basic structure of an autoencoder it is common but not necessary for an m layer autoencoder to have a symmetric architecture between the input and the output the number of units in the kth layer is same as that in the m minus kth layer that is common but it's not necessary so the value of m is often odd as a result of which the m plus 1 by 2th layer is often the most constricted layer now note that we are counting the non computational input layer as a first layer the minimum so so the minimum number of layers in an auto encoder would be 3 which corresponds to the input layer the constricted layer and the output layer as we will see later you can represent singular value decomposition as a three layer auto encoder so uh, in the under complete auto encoder which is what we have discussed so far the number of units in each middle layer is typically fewer than that in the input so the units in the middle layer the, the activations in the middle layer they hold a reduced representation of the data and the final layer can no longer reconstruct the data exactly so to go back to my previous slide so for your five dimensional input so when you input a five dimensional point here the activation of the two units in the middle the the layer containing two units that corresponds to a two dimensional representation of the, of the data that's a reduced representation of your data set so 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 like all dimensional reduction techniques this type of reconstruction is is inherently lossy but these activations of the hidden layers they provide an alternative to linear and non and non linear dimensional reduction techniques another interesting fact about this way of reducing the data is that you can learn a hierarchically reduced representation so for example in this particular architecture you can get a three dimensional rep representation as well as a two dimensional representation and the three dimensional representation and the two dimensional representation they are hierarchically related now uh, so far we have only discussed the case where the hidden layer contains fewer units than uh, the input or output layers so uh, one question that arises is that suppose i have an auto encoder in which by a hidden layer has more units than the input or output layer so in the previous example uh, i have shown a case where you have an input layer containing five 
features. Now imagine that you could construct an autoencoder in which the hidden layer has seven units. So what happens in this case? <clears throat> now one point is that there are infinitely many hidden representations with zero error because you don't have a constriction in the middle. And one of these representations is the case where you can just copy the input from layer to layer uh, right down to the output. Of course, this is not a very interesting learning of the representation because you are just learning the identity function. However, in practice, since there are infinitely many representations, the middle layers often do not learn the identity function. Because what happens is that the middle layers, often they learn one of those other infinitely many hidden representations. Furthermore, even though here the uh, this uh, the representation is highly redundant because it's an overcomplete autoencoder. You can enforce specific properties on the redundant representation by adding constraints or the regularization to the hidden layer. In fact, when even if you don't add, explicitly add constraints or regularization to the hidden layer, the very fact that you're training with stochastic gradient descent adds a kind of noise to the data. And that itself prevents the learned representation to be the identity function. Now you can add other interesting constraints on the hidden layer. So you can learn different types of representation. You can learn, for example, sparse features by adding sparsity constraints to the hidden layer. Now autoencoders have many applications. They're very useful uh, in neural networks. One application, of course, is dimension reduction, which, is the, uh, which corresponds to the activations of the constricted hidden layer. Then you can, you can also use over complete autoencoders uh, where you can learn sparse representations of the data. Uh, and in this case, you will be using the activations of a constrained or regularized hidden layer. Autoencoders are also used for outlier detection. Now note that the reconstruction is inherently lossy. Typically what happens is that data points which do not satisfy the natural distribution of the data set will have large reconstruction errors. So just by looking at the reconstruction error of a data point, you can create an outlier score. This point is also related to denoising applications of autoencoders. So typically the reconstructed representation is a denoised representation of the input. In fact, you can explicitly train your autoencoder to learn a denoise representation by adding additional noise to your input, which is referred to as a denoising autoencoder. You can also learn uh, the generative models with the probabilistic hidden layers. One such example is a variational autoencoder. Now, uh, in most autoencoders, the encoder part is the more useful part because once you train an autoencoder, you typically use only the encoder part to learn the code because the output of the hidden layer gives you the reduced representation of your data set. However, in generative model, it is a decoder part, the part after the constricted representation, which you can use to generate your data set. As we'll see in uh, later lectures, Autoencoders are very also very useful in the training process of neural networks by using a technique called unsupervised pre-training. 